So let's now spend some time looking uh, okay. So let's now spend some time looking at uh, All right, so now let's take a closer look at uh, stability in negative feedback systems. Um, we all now understand the basic idea, right? So at a very um, intuitive level, a negative feedback system becomes unstable when there is too much delay in the loop, right? So what is the negative feedback loop trying to do? It is trying to look at the output, compare it with the desired input and is going and kicking something to make, is going kicking the output in the right direction. Now if, if uh, this, if, if, the, uh, if the output is not responding quick enough to the correction, then what is the feedback loop going to do? Is saying, oh my God, the output is not responding, let me go and kick harder, right? Okay. And then it kicks hard. And by the time this takes to propagate to the output, it's taken a long time. But by that time, the output has responded to the earlier stimulus and it has actually gone down. But then it says, uh, but then it's seeing a correction still in the same direction, correct? And so this basically becomes a, a vicious circle and, and the eventually in steady state the output is oscillating. That is at a very simplistic level what is happening with, with instability, when there is instability in a negative feedback loop, hmm? right. So uh, it is all great to say this, but uh, we got to be, as engineers, we got to be a lot more uh, careful about what we say and uh, more importantly, we have to put numbers to what we say. Hmm? So one common uh, thing that uh, one encounters when designing a feedback system is, okay, I have this loop gain function, I have this forward amplifier, I have this feedback factor, is this amplifier going to be stable? That is, as an amplifier designer, that is my first concern, right? Okay. So, I mean, there must be some clean mathematical way of doing, understanding stability in a negative feedback system. Hmm? So, we will take uh, a look at a very solid and reliable technique for doing this. Um, this is called the Nyquist criterion. Uh, so some uh, notation first and then some mathematical preliminaries which are needed to understand the Nyquist criterion. Okay, I mean, I'm sure a lot of us have done this in our control systems class and promptly forgotten it after the class is over, right? Uh, it turns out that, you know, at, at first it seems a little daunting. Uh, and we, as circuit designers, we, we are more used to the Bode plot and, you know, gain and margin and phase margin and stuff like that. Uh, unfortunately, the Bode plot is, uh, is, uh, is not as great a tool for understanding stability as the Nyquist plot, okay? When I say not as great, it is not as reliable when there are zeros in the system. When, there, when the network is all pole, when the loop gain has only poles, then the Bode plot is, is, uh, is a reasonable thing to do. But uh, in a lot of circuits, um, you know, feed forward stabilization of, of feedback systems uh, is, is a very attractive thing to do. And uh, in such systems, the Bode plot might not always be the right way to analyze stability. In fact, uh, there can be several places where uh, you can wrongly conclude that the system will be unstable when it is actually stable, okay? One thing we know for sure that a system is unstable is the following, right? We know for sure that the system will be unstable if the closed loop system as we know has a transfer function 1 by h times <coughs> loop 
loop gain divided by 1 plus loop gain, where this loop gain function is g of s times h of s. All right. And one thing we know for absolutely sure is that if the loop gain function goes to minus 1 at some j omega, all right, what does that mean? What does this mean? It means that the closed loop gain is infinite which means that there is an output without an input, which basically means that uh, this is not something that you would want, is not it? You want the out amplifier output to respond to your input, not generate noise of its own, correct. So, clearly when the loop gain evaluated at j omega at some j omega is equal to minus 1, there is definitely, I mean the closed loop gain going to infinity means that the closed loop system has a pole at what frequency? Let us say, let us say we are evaluating the loop gain function and we find that at j omega x, the loop gain actually becomes equal to minus 1, all right. So, what can I say? Can I make any comment on uh, the, the, the poles of the closed loop system? Pardon? What at omega x? I mean the loop gain evaluated j omega x equal to minus 1. So, the, the closed loop gain is infinity at at s equal to j omega x, correct? You understand? So, what does this mean? Can we make any comment on the location of the closed loop poles? Pole is at what frequency? It is at j omega x, right? What is the definition of a pole? A pole of a transfer function is, what does it mean if I say s is equal to 1 is a, is a pole of a transfer function, what does that mean? If I evaluate the transfer function at that point, the gain of the transfer function the magnitude of the transfer function becomes infinite. That is what a pole means, right. So, when I say the loop gain evaluated at j omega x is equal to minus 1, then the closed loop gain is infinity, which means that the closed loop system has a pole at j omega x. And we know that we are dealing with uh, systems, uh, uh, real systems. So, if there is a pole at plus j omega x, there must also be a pole at minus j omega x, correct? So, which basically means that the system must have, the denominator of the closed loop system must at least be of this form and something else, right? Which is basically equivalent to saying that the closed loop poles are on the j omega axis, there are, which is the boundary between the left half s plane and the right half s plane. Does that make sense? All right. So, so this is something that we know for sure. And this translated into magnitude and phase means that if the magnitude of the loop gain evaluated at some frequency omega x is 1 and the phase of the loop gain evaluated at that same frequency happens to be 180 degrees, then the closed loop system is unstable this loop gain being equal to minus 1 at omega x is equivalent to both these conditions, right. So, this is what brings us to the common notion of gain and you know and phase margin and all this other stuff. But the only thing we know for absolutely sure is that if this condition is satisfied, the closed loop system is unstable. Now, the obvious question is, okay, what if the loop gain magnitude was greater than 1? Let us say the loop gain magnitude was, was 2 and the phase was not 180 degrees, but say 200 degrees. Do you think that system is stable or unstable?
How many unstable? How many stable? No, the system either got to be stable or unstable. Huh? Isn't it? Okay, well, then, without putting, uh, what if the gain was greater than 1? The phase is 180 degrees, but let's say the gain was 2. The loop gain magnitude was 2. Now, how many people say stable? Only 1. Unstable? Lot more. Okay. So, we'll see that, uh, yeah, so this is the common intuition that you would think you would get from Bode analysis, right? We'll see that this is not necessarily true. And we can show any number of amplifiers where the gain is much larger than 1, the phase can be more than 180 degrees, the phase lag can be say 270 degrees and the system will be still stable. Okay. So, it is to basically uh, the idea behind talking about the Nyquist criterion is to remove some of these popular misconceptions that we as circuit designers have. I mean the control systems people have figured all this out long ago. Okay. As circuit designers we are normally used to verifying stability using the body plots. Okay. And uh, as I will show you going forward, we will see that uh, it leads to many inconsistencies. Uh, one, common one common misconception is the fact that if you increase the gain of the forward amplifier, do you think the system will become more stable or more unstable? So, the general tendency is to believe that if I increase the gain of the forward amplifier while keeping everything else the same, the system becomes more unstable. I will show you examples where the opposite is true. I will increase the gain of the forward amplifier and the system actually becomes more stable. And the other misconception, the opposite thing is that if I decrease the gain of the forward amplifier, the system becomes more stable. That is what we are expecting from Bode, right? And uh, I can show you that this is also not necessarily true. I can show you examples of systems where I decrease the gain and the system actually becomes unstable. All right. So, so let us uh, get going on understanding the, the Nyquist criterion, which uh, I mean the, the, uh, the Nyquist criterion is a rigorous way of figuring out stability of a feedback system. Hmm? And uh, you know by now uh, the notation is all standard. The denominator of the closed loop transfer function is 1 plus gh. Hmm? And as we all know, if you want the closed loop system to be stable, you want the closed loop poles to be in the left half S plane, right? So, which basically means that uh, we need to basically figure out where the roots of the denominator are, right? The poles of the closed loop system are the places at which the denominator of the closed loop system goes to 0, right? Which is basically this 1 plus gh, the 1 plus loop gain. Okay. So, before I go forward, is it possible that the system be stable open loop, I mean is, uh, is unstable open loop, but is stable closed loop? Yes. Can you give me a simple example? Can you give me an example of a system which is unstable open loop, but is stable closed loop? A more mundane example, integrator is, you know, somebody can argue it is marginally stable, right? Look at this. It is unstable, isn't it? Isn't it? That is because there is no feedback. Now, can I stabilize it? I mean, I cannot because I am not fast enough, but, right? But you can see that if you had a sufficiently long pole so that it does not fall off so quickly, I can, I can always stabilize the, make the rod stand up while still being, it is still standing up which without feedback was unstable, right. So, the open loop system being unstable does not mean that the closed loop system is unstable. The open loop system being stable also has no bearing on the stability of the closed loop. Hmm? So, the all important quantity is the loop gain g h. Okay. So, before we get into the uh, nitty gritty of uh, the Nyquist principle, I mean uh, the Nyquist uh, criterion, uh, 
the basis of this criterion has got to do with complex analysis um, and so the, uh, the 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 foundation of the whole thing is what is called a Cauchy's principle of argument hmm? and this pertains to complex analysis. So if you consider a complex function f of s, now this Cauchy's principle of argument has got nothing to do with feedback, right? So when he discovered it, uh, you know, it was it was just simply for the fun of it. It's complex analysis from a purely mathematical viewpoint. So he says, consider a complex function f of s. It's a rational function, and uh, therefore it's a ratio of polynomials in s. <coughs> now you go around. I mean, you draw a closed contour in the s plane, and you must make sure that. So, so this is the s plane. Right, this is sigma and then this is j omega. All right. So he says this is some function. There's some function f of s. Let's say s minus one by s plus two, something like that, some random function. Hmm? Now, if I take a closed path in the s plane and evaluate f of s for each one of these points on the contour, I'll get a table. Right. So for this is S1, let's say this is S2, this is S3, and so on. So I can make a table S1, f of S1, S2, f of S2, blah blah blah, Sn, f of Sn, and I keep going around. So clearly, for a continuous curve, there'll be infinite number of points placed, spaced infinitely close to each other, and you can make a table of values S versus f of s. Now, these are all complex numbers and so are these for that matter. Okay. All right. So, if I now plot f of s1, please note that f of s1 is a complex number, so it has got magnitude and, and phase, all right. So I will get something like this perhaps, s2, when I plot f of s2, I will get something like this, when I mark f of s3, I will get something like this. So in general, when I mark a closed curve like this, and if I keep marking f of s1, f of s2, f of sn and so on, when I when I complete the fully closed curve, what do you think will happen to the f of s? I will get points like this, okay, some some points like this and if the main curve is a closed curve, if I trace a closed path in the s plane, then if I join all these points in the f of s plane, it must also be, you, it must also be closed, okay. So, that's the that's what i mean by this is the f of s plane all right and this is the s plane seems intuitive enough right so if the main curve is closed the uh, the the curve in the mapped out by this transformation f of s is also a closed curve now the only terms and conditions as far as the, the contour must be is that it must not pass through any singular points. What are singular points? The poles, I mean a, a singular point from a mathematical point of view uh, is defined as a point where the derivatives do not exist, right? I mean from a, uh, from a layman's point of view, as an engineer, if somebody told you it is a singular point, it basically means that bad things are happening there, you do not want to go anywhere near it, right? So, the uh, Cauchy's principle of arg argument states that if you trace any curve in the S plane, all right, and if this if this curve does not pass through any singular points, meaning it does not pass through any of the poles of f of s, then 
if the contour encloses one pole of f of s encloses so this is the s plane this is the f of s plane let us say f of s was s minus 1 by s plus 2 just some function where are the poles of f of s s is equal to minus 2 is a pole s is equal to plus 1 is a 0. So, what this Cauchy's principle argu argument is saying is that hey choose any closed contour in the s plane any closed contour just make sure that this closed contour does not pass through a, a singular point basically means that anything which does not pass through this cross the pole here ok the minus 2 point is a legal valid curve and then he says for each one of these s points points on this contour you find f of s and plot f of s or mark f of s off here right. So, for example, this point let us say maps to here, this point maps somewhere else ok and so on. So, e <coughs> corresponding to each one of these points here, there is a point in the f of s plane. So, now you have a curve in the f of s plane, a closed curve in the f of s plane. Now, what Cauchy claims is that if the contour in the s plane encloses one pole of f of s right then the contour in the f of s plane will encircle the origin once ok you understand. So, let me show that with an example. So, this is uh, stuff that I have actually computed. Uh, which do you think is the s plane? The function f of s is s plus 1 by s minus 2. There is a pole at s is equal to plus 2 and there is a 0 at s is equal to minus 1. Okay? Now, for every point on this curve, So, the contour I have chosen is basically a rectangle, a rectangle is as good a closed curve as any. Hmm? So, I have plotted for each one of these points, I have plotted the corresponding situation here and basically because this is a closed curve, this is also a closed curve and as per the terms of the agreement, we decided not to go through any of the singular points, correct. So, this is a legally closed, a legal closed curve and no wonder this is also a closed curve. Now, what this Cauchy's principle argument is saying is that if this curve in the s plane encloses a pole, then the closed curve in the f of s plane will encircle the origin which is 0 comma 0 that point mark there once in the counterclockwise direction. Yes, sir. Yes. So, if, if you go in, uh, in the clockwise direction here, you will enclose it in the counterclockwise direction in this is reverse, then you will you will go in the opposite direction. Yeah. Pardon? Correct. Yeah, I mean, so if you go clockwise direction here, then the you define enclosed as the one which is to your right. Okay, you understand. So it's like this. Uh, so if you enclose the pole, one pole, then you will go. You will enclose the origin in the f of s plane once. Hmm? Then, what happens uh, when you enclose a zero? Cauchy also states that if the contour in the s plane encloses a 0 of f of s, then 
you will enclose the, the closed curve in the f of s plane, will enclose the origin in the clockwise direction. Okay. So, an example therefore is I have now chosen a contour which encloses the 0 and you can see that the, the closed contour actually I have not marked the, uh, the direction, it actually must go around in the clockwise direction. Does it make sense? So, uh, what do you think will happen if I enclose one pole and one zero? It if there's a if there's a pole, if the contour in the S plane encloses a pole, you go around once in the clockwise direction. If you go if there's a if it encloses a zero, you go in the in the clockwise direction. So when you enclose both a pole and zero, then you know, you go in no direction basically, right. So, you do not enclose the origin at all, okay. So, this principle can be rigorously proved, it is not, uh, uh, I am not going to cover it here, but it can be proved, it is not too difficult, right. But the key point is basically it is telling you that you can, I mean, what is the, what is, what do you think is the utility of this principle? How can we use it? Yeah, so if you, if you want to figure out, I mean, let us say you wanted to figure out if there were you wanted to figure out whether there was a pole in this area, right. Let us say you know that there are no zeros, you wanted to figure out if there is a pole in this area, then what will you do? You will evaluate f of s for every point on this contour and plot a some f of s. This is the s plane this is the f of s plane. If the, if the contour in the f of s plane encircles the origin, then you know that there is a pole inside the area, correct. You do not know where the pole exactly is, but you know that there is a pole inside this small area, right. So, and so why is this useful? So, this Cauchy's principle of argument is telling you is giving you a tool to be able to figure out if there is a pole in a certain area in the complex plane, right. And uh, this is useful because we are interested in finding out the stability of a system, which means that we are trying to find out how many poles or uh, first of all we are interested in finding out if there are any poles at all in the, in the right half S, correct. So, presumably if we found a contour which enclosed the entire right half S plane, then you know looking at encirclements around the origin, this kind of using this principle might be useful in, will be useful in telling us how many poles there are in the right half S plane, looking at encirclements around the origin. That is the basic idea. Does it make sense? Okay. This argument is telling you that uh, you know uh, the the uh, the uh, I'll, I'll just address your question. The question is, he's asking is, is it so clearly? If there's one pole and one zero inside the contour, you're you're not going to encircle the origin. So this, I mean, so it seems as if it is not as uh, you know great as it seems after all, right? But we'll see that in a, in a negative feedback amplifier, um, uh, in many cases, in more, I mean, in all almost all practical cases, you will find that uh, it's only uh, we do not have, uh, I mean, there is only one category of things happening, the, the, the only uh, zeros that we need to count. I will I'll come to that in a couple of minutes, but, but this Cauchy's uh, <coughs> principle of argument is a powerful mathematical tool which helps us figure out if there is a pole in a given area. So, if you want to find out if there is a, a pole in the, in, the, in the given area, right, then what do you do? You go around the, you go around that area, alright, and 
you plot the f of s corresponding to the this thing. Yes. So, so this is just giving us a tool to figure out if the pole is in a given area. That's all. And if you're interested in figuring figuring out if the system is stable or not, the first question is: I've designed a negative feedback system. Is my system stable? And for that, the the only question I need to answer is: Are there any poles in the right half s plane? In other words, is there a pole in this area? This area means the right half. You understand? Closed loop poles, correct? No, no. This is not. This is just uh, an illustration of the Cauchy's principle of argument. We have still not yet applied it to a negative feedback system. Yes, yes. If I know FS, yeah, this is a good point, right? So you're saying uh, you know FFS. Why do I need to know? Uh, why do I need to go through all this stuff? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll come to that, right? So this again, as I said, this is just an illustration of the Cauchy's principle of argument. I just want to show you that it works. Okay. Uh, we'll see how to apply this to a negative feedback system in a, a few slides following. But is this clear? For example, you know, if you know that your credit card was lost in Delhi. Right? Then you complain to the police. What are they going to do? They're going to look for all credit card transactions happening in, hopefully, in and around the Delhi area, right? And you know, and from all the transactions that that uh, emanate from Delhi after you lost your card, from that they'll be able to pinpoint if some fellow has, I mean, has been misusing your card, isn't it? So it doesn't make sense if you lost your credit card in, in Delhi. It doesn't make sense to start looking in Kolkata, right? You understand? Unless the guy has flown off with your card. Hmm? Okay. So, this way, I mean, so, th th this is a very powerful argument because it is telling you that, I mean, if, if there is a pole inside the area, as a simple minded guy, what would I do? I mean, if I know that there is a pole, I mean, if I wanted to know whether there is a pole in a certain area, what will I do as a, if I did not know Cauchy's principle? I will divide up the area into many points, I check out if this point is a pole, this point is a pole, this point is a pole, this point is a pole and so on, as, a, as you know, without knowing anything else, right? But this principle gives us a very elegant way of figuring out if there is a pole inside without doing this point by point. It is telling you just go around the the area. For example, if you lost a gold ring here, the only thing to do would be to search here and search there and search there and search there. But Koshi is telling you just go around the room, only around the perimeter and magically you are able to find whether, it is only telling you that the either the, the ring is either in this room or not. Okay? It is not telling you where the ring is. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess uh, you know it's an analogy. So you know, like most analogies, you can't take them too far. All right. Okay. So, so as we discussed, if the contour includes one pole and one zero, which means that if there's a hole in the carpet, then the ring is lost forever, right? You can't find the the uh, uh, the FFS curve does not enclose the origin at all. And an example is is this. So you can see that this this curve on the in the S plane encloses both the pole and the zero, and you know viola in the f of s plane, you see that the thing does not enclose the origin at all. Okay. Now there are the obvious question is how do we apply this to to feedback systems? And uh, and now that I have convinced you about uh, you know one pole and one zero, you can uh, you should believe me when I say that if the contour in the S plane encloses n poles and m zeros, then you go clockwise. 
I mean anti clockwise n times, okay, and clockwise m times. So, in net effect, you have circled the origin n minus m times. You understand? So, the circling also is a pretty uh, interesting concept. So, this is this thing, okay, this is the let us say a pole. Have I circled? Yes. 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 So, please note that we have still not yet applied this to negative feedback systems. So far, I have just told you that if there is a complex function. Yes, uh, so I'll 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 uh, I'll clear your doubts. Give me a couple of minutes, right? So the uh, the thing to take away so far is that this is we have just we have, we have, I just shown you a hammer, right? And told you it can hammer an nail. Now you know you want to fix a screw and you don't have a screwdriver and you want to figure out how to use the hammer, correct? So this is just a tool so far, and Kaushi poor guy had nothing to do with negative feedback at all, all right? So the it was Nyquist to basically realize the potential of this tool and applied it to negative feedback systems in a foolproof manner, right? And we will see that uh, as we go along. But uh, one thing is, uh, do you think this is enclosed the uh, the the circle or no? Yes, no. Have you enclosed? Uh, I'm sorry. This is the this is the guy to be enclosed. Have you enclosed or not? We have not enclosed, right? Because if you keep going around like this, for example, I mean, and you say that everything to the right is enclosed, then you have basically not enclosed the. Okay. What about? Uh, this thing we have still not enclosed correct so i mean think of this as uh, as uh, you know you go how many of you i don't know how many of you still go to temples right but you go to temple and you start this is the deity you go like this and now once you have enclosed right but if you go three fourths of the way and then turn back huh you have not enclosed and you are you know one step you are one step short of heaven huh you understand so every time you enclose the deity in uh, uh, you are one step closer to heaven okay so so this enclosure is you know again a careful thing to be uh, to interpret all right so again this is another example of where uh, the enclosure is uh, a little bit uh, you have to be interpreted a little carefully so there are two poles and one zero in this system, right? So the contour is enclosing two poles and one zero. So what would we expect from Cauchy's princi uh, uh, principle of argument? We should enclose the origin once in the counterclockwise direction. Let's see if it actually does that. Okay. So the sense of the arrow is uh, I will start at the extreme right. Okay, and keep. The sense, the sense of the arrow is is this way, uh, is in the counter counterclockwise direction. So I start here. This is the deity, okay? And you start. You keep going this, doing this. Then you do this, and then you kind of change your mind, and then you come back, and then uh, uh, you know you again remember God and decide to go back all over again, right? So this is a wash, right? You're not really, you've gone in a circle, but you're not enclosed the deity, right? So, how many times have you enclosed the uh, the Lord once only? Even though you have gone around in a circle twice, you have enclosed only once and that is what Koshi is telling you, right? You could put yourself in a loop 100,000 times but you have actually enclosed only once and sure enough that is equal to the number of poles minus the number of right? Okay. All right. Now the question is, how do we apply this to our situation, which is 
stability of a negative feedback system. Okay, so when we say we want, we are interested in uh, determining the stability of the system, we are interested in figuring out if the closed loop system has any poles in the right half plane, correct? And as we all know, the closed loop poles are nothing but the roots of the denominator. The denominator polynomial is 1 plus g h. We want to find out if the closed loop has got poles in the right half plane, which is equivalent to saying, I want to find out the locations of the zeros of 1 plus g h. Because the zeros of 1 plus g h are the poles of the closed loop system. Right? So, one thing that comes to our aid uh, is basically the fact that in most circuit work, right, uh, almost always the uh, the open loop system is always stable. Okay, you have a lot of gain. Uh, you have you know uh, integrators, but in practice, what we will find, as uh, Nagendra discussed, you will find that finite gain is something which is you know we, which you get without asking at all, right? If you want, you'll never get an ideal integrator. You'll get an integrator only with a finite gain. So, if you plot the magnitude of the integrator, you basically, you find that the gain will never go to infinity. What does this mean as far as the, uh, uh, the transfer function of the integrator is concerned? It is basically, ideally you want an integrator to be 1 by s, which means that at dc, its gain is infinite. In practice, the gain is not infinite, it is actually 1 by delta, where delta is a small number. And then, you know, as you saw, to get more and more gain, the motivation for getting more and more gain is that the steady state error becomes lesser and lesser and lesser. Okay. So, in order to get a lot of gain, what would you do? You would basically take these individual stages which kind of behave like integrators and put many of them in cascade. So, you will find that the open loop system, for example, if you took three of them and put them in cascade, this is what you would get for the transfer function of the open loop system and where are all the poles? Minus delta and are they in the left half plane or the right half plane? They are all in the left half plane, correct? Right? So, in in uh, uh, in almost all cases in practice, the open loop system is, is stable, which means that the poles of the open loop system are in the left half plane, correct? If the open loop system is stable, then the poles of the open loop system are in the left half s plane and can you comment on the poles of g of uh, g h and 1 plus g h? The loop gain, the open, I mean, the loop gain is g h, right? But we are now looking at the denominator polynomial which is actually 1 plus g h. The poles of GH are in the left half S plane because the open loop system is stable. And what is the, the definition of a pole? The definition of a pole is, is that frequency at which the magnitude goes to infinity. So, clearly if GH goes to infinity, 1 plus GH also goes to infinity, correct? Which means that the poles of G of H, uh, GH and 1 plus g h are in the, are the same and they are in the left half s plane, correct? So, in other words, we have this, we are trying to figure out the location of the roots of 1 plus g of s h of s, okay? We are trying to figure out the location of of the zeros of 1 plus g of s h of s because the zeros of this are the poles of the closed loop function. And by practicality, this function 1 plus g h does not have any poles in the, I mean this is a complex function, this has zeros and poles, correct? But by practicality, this does not have any poles in the right half s plane. Correct? 
So, what does this mean? So, if I plot, so if I think of this as the f of s in Cauchy's principle of argument, what that principle is telling us is that if I plot, if I go around a certain area in the s plane and plot f of s, correct? The number of encirclements around the origin must be equal to number of zeros of f of s. Correct? Because they're by practicality they're the poles of. I mean, let me rephrase my statement. So if I if I draw a closed contour in the right half s plane hmm, and compute f of s, I'll get a closed curve. Here, the number of encirclements of f of s around the origin must be equal to the number of zeros enclosed by the contour because by practicality we already decided that there cannot be any poles in the right half s. Is that clear? If there were poles in the right half s plane, then the number of encirclements would actually be equal to the difference between the number of poles and zeros, but we decided already that the open loop system is stable, therefore the poles of the open loop system are all in the left half plane. So, if I chose a contour in the right half s plane only, then the number of encirclements of f of s around the origin is simply an indication of the number of zeros enclosed by the contour. Does it make sense? So, therefore, there is no confusion at all. So, now the next thing to say is, hey, I am not really interested in if finding the number of zeros of f of s here, I want to find the, if there are any zeros of f of s in the, in the entire right half s plane, right, because the zeros of f of s are the poles of the closed loop function closed loop transfer function. If I want the closed loop transfer function to be stable, I should not have any poles in the right half s plane. So, the question I ought to ask is, are there any poles in the right half s plane, which means are there any zeros of f of s in the right half s plane. So, I need to basically make a contour that covers the, the entire right half s plane. So, can you think of a contour which covers the whole right half s plane? Yeah. So, you basically say, you keep going along like this and then you go around, you understand. All right. And so, like if you do, did this, you find the number of encirclements around the origin and the number of encirclements around the origin should give you the number of zeros of f of s in the right half s plane, which is equivalent to the number of closed loop poles in the right half s plane. Pardon? We should find no. Right. Correct? You understand? So, this is basically uh, uh, the uh, the essence of the Nyquist uh, criterion and you can see that it is a basic a fairly straightforward application of this uh, this result from complex analysis applied to an engineering situation hmm? and we will see uh, you know we will see by example uh, various things and uh, you know I will counter some of the popular misconceptions that one ha one uh, we uh, we normally have by simply using uh, in the, the Bode plot type uh, analysis. Now, let us do some. So, so this uh, so as I said, we apply this Cauchy's principle to f of s, which is one plus g h, and we need to use a contour which covers the entire R h p. And you know, as somebody pointed out, 
we need to basically go along the geomega axis and then make this uh, and come back to make the thing closed and clearly the radius must keep getting uh, when the radius tends to infinity the uh, it encloses the entire RHP. So, please note that F of S is 1 plus G H and we want this to enclose the origin, correct. But 1 plus G H enclosing the origin is equivalent to G H enclosing the minus 1 comma 0 point, okay. So, it is a it is only a small uh, what do you call just for convenience instead of adding uh, plotting 1 plus G H I would rather plot G H and instead of I mean uh, circling this point I would I would want to look at encirclements around minus 1 comma 0 which is the original form of the Nyquist criterion. So, the number of encirclements of f of s around minus 1 comma 0 is equal to the number of closed loop poles in the right half s plane. Is that clear? Okay. Now, we'll. Uh, I mean, this is best understood by example. Um, let, let's just consider all pole systems, and we always start with the simplest case, which is a single pole system. So the loop gain function is, say, a first order uh, system with uh, varying gains. So k by s plus 1 and as I keep increasing uh, the gain, so, so this is the minus 1, this is the minus 1 comma 0 point. What do you think is, uh, uh, which do you think corresponds to k equal to 1? Red, blue, green. If k equal to 1, how does g h look? By the way, I have dispensed with the S plane. This is the F of S plane, okay, and this is what is called the Nyquist diagram. The, the S plane has been just a minute. The blue, I mean, the the S plane has been dispensed with because we all know now what contour way to run around, right? We have to go along. One way, good way to do it is start at zero, keep going all the way on the j omega axis up to infinity, come back, go to minus j infinity, and come back all the way to zero. So, since we all know this contour, it does not make sense to keep drawing this contour all over again and uh, you only draw the f of s plane, okay, shifted by minus uh, uh, 1. So, this is what is called the Nyquist diagram. So, 1 by s plus 1, what do you think the value is at s is equal to 0? 1, okay. So, that is that's there. No other point, no other, none of these other curves pass through 1, correct. So, the blue must correspond to 1 by s plus 1. Hmm? So, you start off at s is equal to 0, then you go on increasing. Is this clear to everybody? <coughs> Drawing the Nyquist plot is uh, 1 by s plus 1. So, we start off with s starting at s is equal to 0 and go all this way like this. So, when we are along this direction, uh, then the, the, the f of s becomes 1 by j omega plus 1 as omega st starts from 0 to infinity, correct. So, in other words, we are starting here and going all the way to infinity. So, when omega is 0, what happens? 
what is f of s? 1. It's 1. When uh, s goes to plus j uh, infinity, what happens? It's 0. But please note that it's a complex number, right? It has both magnitude and angle. The magnitude is certainly 0, but how is it approaching the origin? You can come to the origin many ways, right? You can come from below, you can come from above, you can come from the side. One way of, yeah. So, if, if as omega becomes very large, we can see that 1 by 1 plus j omega becomes, the magnitude tends to 0, but the angle tends to minus 90 degrees. So, what is happening is that you are basically coming like this, okay? And minus infinity again you are starting like this and then you are coming back, okay? As you can see, I am not much of an artist, so you would assume that this is a circle. Hmm? And uh, sure enough, there's a it's a closed curve. This is the minus one point. So what is the bottom line? Absolutely, no problem because they uh, it's as far away from minus one as you can be. Hmm? So there's no enclosures of the minus one comma zero point. So it's absolutely stable. As k goes on increasing, so you have k by s plus one. What do you expect to see? It's just that. You will start off with, I mean, when s is 0, you will start off at k. So, this will be become another circle. Again, these two circles are supposed to be coincident at the origin. Okay. So, this is the Nyquist circle uh, diagram for another value of k. And this is the one where the k becomes even larger. And as you can see, I can go on making k as large as I want, but the circles do not seem to be getting any closer to minus 1 comma 0, which basically means that a first order loop gain is unconditionally stable for all values of, all positive values of k. Now, if I make k negative, what will happen? It will start, if I k make k equal to minus 5, then it will start here and then definitely it will do a circle, it will definitely encircle the minus 1 comma 0 point. I mean that we already know and there is nothing, uh, you know, it is not a major revelation because if you change the sense of the feedback, if, if you convert the negative feedback into positive feedback, clearly the system becomes unstable and that we knew already and this is also being confirmed by the Nyquist plot. Okay? All right. So, we understand the first order system. The next thing is to go to a second order all pole system. And uh, so, again, I have taken uh, the case for, of uh, a loop gain of the form k by s plus 1 the whole square. Again, I have plotted it for k equal to 1, 2, and 5. And uh, things, uh, you know, kind of. Uh, look a bit alarming. Why? I mean, are you less worried now or more worried now that your system might be unstable? You are more worried. Why? Because these, these, uh, these circles seem to be getting closer to the minus 1 comma 0 point. Right? So, uh, again, for k equal to 1, you can see that you start off at 1 and then this time uh, the but s is equal to infinity how is the 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 curve approaching 0 it's it's approaching it at from minus 180 so it's actually coming in like this and then uh, kind of uh, approaching uh, this point like tangentially to the x axis all right and again as you as you keep increasing k we see that these curves these circles become bigger and bigger, but we see a little bit of an alarming trend. This the, the circle seems to be getting closer and closer to the minus one comma zero point. So if I increase the size of the circle even more, what do you think will happen? If I made k say not five, but but uh, I mean to reduce steady state error, what do you would what would you want k to be? Ideally, if you want the steady state error to be zero, k should tend to infinity, right? So, uh, that basically means that this 
circle will become bigger and bigger and bigger. And what do you think will happen? As these circles become bigger, what do you think will happen? The circle will come like this, do this, and then approach zero tangentially. And you can see that those circles are getting closer and closer and closer to the minus 1 comma 0 point, which basically is confirming what we analyzed uh, with uh, Nagendra a little before, right? So, as the as the gain keeps increasing, the system is tending closer and closer to instability. However, it is not really becoming unstable because it will never enclose the minus 1 comma 0 point. And the closer this gets to the minus 1 comma 0 point, the more nervous you become, right? Which is equivalent to saying that the stability of the system is becoming lesser and lesser. In other words, the roots are probably moving closer and closer. The closed loop poles are moving closer and closer to the right half S plane, right? Which basically means that they are going closer to the, the poles were originally in the left half plane. As you go on increasing K, they are moving closer and closer. The closest, I mean, so if they had approached the right half plane, the first they will get the, I mean, uh, they will they'll have to get into the S plane by first cutting the J omega axis. So, the poles are getting closer to the J omega. Does this make sense? Okay. Now, let us go to the third order system. Now, again, K is a, again plotted for 1, 2, 5 and I have added another thing for uh, uh, to illustrate instability. So, which is the curve for k equal to 1? The blue one corresponds to k equal to 1. And now, the curve must at s equal to infinity must approach the origin at, at 270 degrees. So, you can see that the curve actually must do, I mean if you look at some of these bigger curves, you can see that the, the curve comes all the way, does this and then is coming, approaching this from the top, all right. And uh, is this enclosing the minus 1 comma 0 point? No. So, k equal to 1 is stable, k equal to 2, this is also stable, right. So, basically, uh, you can see that this is also seems okay. K equal to 5, you can see that th that is the red curve. I have not drawn the bigger part of the circle because then the circle will go outside this line. Hmm? Okay. But you can imagine basically it starts from 5, comes like this, does this, comes like this and then goes away. So, do you think it is encircling the minus 1 comma 0 point? The red curve? Definitely not. Okay. Now, when I increase k to 10, what happens? You can see that the guy is coming like this, is doing this, done that, then done this, correct, and is going all the way there. So, how many times have you circled the deity? Twice. Please note, you started from here, you come, okay, you come here, then you have gone like that you have done this loop. So, you have covered, you have covered once now, then you go all the way and you have covered twice. So, what does that mean? The number of right half plane poles when k equal to 10 is 2, the 2 poles in the right half S plane. Is this something that you expected from, uh, from uh, the Bode analysis? Because, uh, I mean, uh, we probably guess that as you go on increasing, because the, uh, the gain is monotonic and the phase is also monotonic, uh, you would have guessed that as you increase the gain, the system will become unstable. But beyond that, you do not really know what the, I mean, for, uh, this is giving us new information on the fact that the number of poles in the right half plane is, is two. Does it make sense? Okay. So, this is basically telling you that I mean, illustrating the fact that if if you have a system which is uh, third order and higher, then the system, the stability of the closed loop system is not 
is not unconditional. There are some, if the gain becomes too much, in this particular example, it seems as if the system is unstable. Okay? And it turns out that when you have an all pole system, right? So when you have only poles in the loop gain function, then it is true that if you go on increasing the gain of the amplifier, okay, then the system will become will tend to become less and less stable. Hmm? So to summarize, this, this is probably a good breakpoint. So to summarize, first and second order systems are unconditionally stable. Third and higher order systems, as we saw for the specific case of the third order, is conditionally stable. And for all pole systems, the magnitude and phase are monotonically changing. Okay, and which means that with a sufficiently large gain, I can always make a stable high order system with only poles in the loop gain function. By putting sufficiently large gain, I can always make it unstable. Correct? Because getting back to Bode, if the magnitude is going on decreasing, right, it is monotonic, alright, and the phase is also monotonic, okay, so if this is minus 180 degrees and uh, let us say This was the 0 dB line. This is mod loop gain. This is the angle loop gain. So, do you think the system is stable or not? If the system has only poles, do you think the system is stable or not? It is stable because when the phase is 180 degrees, the magnitude has gone down below 0 dB. Now, if I want to make it unstable, what can I do? I simply increase the gain which basically will push this plot up by some factor, right. So, by adding gain, I can always make this, this unstable. That is the characteristic of all pole systems where our usual intuition works quite well. Hmm? And uh, as, I, uh, as I will show after lunch, when wrongly applied to other systems where there are no poles, I mean where there are not only poles but there are also zeros, we can make many serious errors and I will show you uh, things which contradict uh, intuition as we, when we come back from lunch. Thanks. Right. So, uh, to summarize uh, what we had done before lunch, we saw that if you have a loop gain function which is all pole, then first and second order systems are unconditionally stable, third and higher order systems are conditionally stable. In the specific case of the third order uh, system, we saw that if all the three poles are sitting at the same location, then making the gain now 10 is certainly unstable. 5 is stable, so the limit of stability that is the, the the value of k where the Nyquist plot just intersects the, uh, the minus 1 comma 0 point happens to be 8. Hmm? So, high order systems basically ex, uh, exhibit conditional stability. Now, let me pose the following question. This uh, is the Bode plot of a of a feedback system. Okay. On the top, I have shown the magnitude and uh, in dB and below I have shown the phase. So, do you think when I close, this is the, this is the uh, Bode plot of the of the loop gain function. So, do you think 
the closed loop system is stable or unstable? Hey, look, I can show you any number of frequencies where the gain look at some frequency here. The phase is is minus some 235 odd degrees, right? Or 250 odd degrees. And the gain is much larger than 1. It is 50 dB in fact, right? Okay. So, do you think the system is stable or unstable? If you think that it is unstable, I will show you that this in fact, when you close the loop, is in fact stable. And uh, it is uh, to basically uh, you figure out where we have gone wrong is where the uh, Nyquist plot is a very helpful tool. Um, so, from the Bode plot, it would seem as if the uh, the closed loop system is unstable, would be unstable and uh, as an example uh, here I have shown a G of S, H of S where the loop gain function is third order and so there are three amplifiers uh, in cascade and there is uh, finite DC gain. So, this delta is a very, very, very small number corresponding to the high DC gain of each state. And there are some, there is some numerator, which basically means that the loop gain function is not an all pole function, there are zeros also. Hmm? So, it turns out, how will you find the, uh, the, uh, the closed loop poles? The zeros of 1 plus g h, right? And what is 1 plus g h? It is approximately, if I set ten, delta 10 into 0, the denominator polynomial of the closed loop system is 1 plus g h which is s q plus 3 s square plus 4 s plus 2. This is the denominator of the closed loop system. And if you, I mean to find the roots, what would you do? You would factor the, the polynomial and once you do that, it turns out that the poles are at minus 1 and minus 1 plus minus j. Okay? So, do you think the closed loop system is stable or unstable? very much stable, right, because the real parts of all the poles of the closed loop poles are negative. Hmm? So, what is the phase lag of the loop gain at DC? It is at, at DC, delta is slightly positive, correct, S is 0, this is 0, this is 0. So, what is the phase lag at DC? 0, okay. As soon as S becomes uh, a little larger, then what happens to the phase? It goes to minus 270, right? As soon as S becomes a little larger, as delta is tending to 0, is very, very small positive number. As soon as S starts to become large, the phase of this becomes 90 degrees each. So, the phase quickly goes to minus 270. The numerator, of course, S is very small compared to 2. So, at that point, you will find that the numerator phase is, is 0. So, the total phase of the loop gain function becomes minus 270. Okay? So, at DC it is 0, at low frequencies where low frequency is defined as much smaller than uh, 1 radian per second, you see that the phase is suddenly goes to, the phase lag goes to 270 degrees. Now, the magnitude at low frequencies is, is very large because what is the magnitude at low frequency? It is approximately 2 by delta q, right, and it is falling off as frequency increases. So, this is clearly a system where A, the closed loop system is stable, the gain is much larger than 1 over a wide frequency range, the phase is the loop gain, the phase of the loop gain is larger than 180 degrees over a large region and still the closed loop system is stable. Does this, does this make sense? So, this is a case which contradicts our traditional intuition of, of stability, correct? So, what I have shown you is a system which is stable, 
even though you know we i mean uh, we thought that it should be unstable because there are uh, frequency points where the magnitude is much larger than 1 and the phase is is uh, the phase lag is greater than 180 degree so how do we explain this and clearly it seems like the bode plot is not really helping us here isn't it so the way of understanding this is the nyquist plot hmm? so uh, one thing to notice in this picture uh, is the x axis okay it stretches all the way from 0 to minus 90 all right the minus 1 comma 0 point is that point there okay at s equal to 0 what do you think the uh, uh, the nyquist plot should should look like let me go back up so that you can see the function at s equal to 0 the nyquist plot must start at 2 by delta the whole cube and is that a small number or a large number delta is very very small so 2 by delta cube must be very large so where is the nyquist plot starting it is starting you know somewhere there okay and then it's coming like this and then coming all the way right and then doing this and then coming down here and as s tends to infinity what happens to the uh, to the nyquist plot let me the magnitude must go to zero right what do you think must happen to the phase as s tends to infinity we see that this tends to 1 by s so it must approach the origin from the minus 90 degree direction so we see that it is indeed doing so that is the origin the the curve is starting from somewhere there coming like this doing this and then approaching s is equal to 0 in the uh, in the 90 degree direction and the rest of the curve it goes up like this and does correct so now do you think we are uh, encircling the deity or no maybe a diagram would help this is the minus 1 comma 0 point all right you started off somewhere from from here okay which is some 2 by delta q or something like that okay and then you did this you decided to go like this come back okay then what did you do you decided to go like this then come back and then do something like this okay the top half must be a reflection of the bottom half but for the purpose of encirclement argument it doesn't matter so do you think we have encircled the minus 1 comma 0 point or not no we have not right uh, let me draw that again observe carefully i am doing this i i go there all right i do this okay then I come up, come like this, then I do this, do this again, and then come back. Encircled or no, no encirclement? See, your seat in heaven is at stake here. Huh? It is not encircled, it, isn't it? Is that clear to all of you? Okay. So, even though it, you know, looks like uh, you are up there clearly it has not encircled the the minus 1 comma 0 point which means what there are this 1 plus g h does not have any zeros in the right half s plane which is equivalent to saying that the closed loop system is stable okay and in the nyquist plot can you tell me uh, 
which point in this in this curve corresponds to gh the angle of gh being equal to uh, 180 degrees this is a plot of gh correct this curve here i started off from zero and then did this 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 way come this way all right so which points on these curve is correspond to the loop gain gh having an angle of uh, 180 degrees which one One eighty degrees means what? The phasor must be like this. So this point is one point where the phase is one eighty degrees. This is another point where the phase is one eighty degrees. And in both cases, you see that the magnitude is what is the magnitude? It is simply this distance. This is the magnitude at, of the loop gain at the point where the phase is one eighty degrees. Okay, so you can see. Can you compare that to one and tell me whether the magnitude is much greater than one or less than one? It's much much greater than one because the magnitude of one means somewhere around there. That's that's the a vector with one magnitude. So this magnitude is clearly much larger than one. And you can see that there is a whole range of frequencies. In fact, there are two specific frequencies where the phase is 180 degrees. And the gain is the magnitude of the gain is much larger than one, and the system is stable. There is also a whole range of frequencies corresponding to this curve here, where the phase lag is greater than 180 degrees, the magnitude is greater than one, and the system is stable. Okay, this can only happen if there are zeros. If there are only poles in the transfer function, in the loop gain function, how do you think the uh, the uh, the uh, the Nyquist plot would look? What do you think? One thing which is certainly not possible in an all-pole loop gain function. So, if if you had only poles in the loop gain function, the phase is monotonically decreasing and the magnitude is also monotonically decreasing. So this. Nyquist plot will start from somewhere here and spiral down eventually to to zero. It can never do this backtracking, right? It can't change its mind. You decide to go uh, and then encircle and then halfway down you say no, 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 I want to go back, right? And then you go there and then you know you change your mind again. That's not possible with a with an all pole system. Is that clear? Okay. All right. So, while the Bode plot, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, rather the intuition that we use with the with all pole systems, if you apply it all to, if you wrongly apply it to uh, to systems with zeros, then you can get very wrong intuition, as this example proves. And uh, we, I mean, we understand now why we made a mistake, right? Uh, the the, the correct thing to do is to understand uh, stability as by as given by the Nyquist criteria. Hmm? This explains, I mean, from this we see that there is no contradiction. Correct? So this is what uh, this is a common misconception on a lot of people. So the statement made is if the magnitude is greater than zero dB and the phase lag is larger than 180 degrees. The, From the bow, looking at, I mean, so the uh, what do you call the common phase margin argument? Okay, see, the only truth to the whole thing is, is we only know one thing with certainty. That is, if the magnitude is one and the phase is 180 degrees, then without any doubt whatsoever, the closed loop system has poles on the geomega, geomega axis. That's the only thing that is. All right. 
it does not mean that if the loop gain is greater than 1 and the phase is less than 180 degrees, and phase lag is more than 180 degrees, the system is unstable, uh, is stable. Okay? It does not follow from this statement. The only statement that is correct is that if magnitude of loop gain is 1 and the phase is 180 degrees, the system is unstable. For the special case of an all pole system, all right, if the magnitude uh, is uh, 1 and the phase is greater than 180 degrees, then you will be definitely unstable. Okay, you can prove that also from the from the Nyquist plot. So let me, since you brought it up, let me just cover it anyway. Uh, so this is the f of s plane. It's an all-pole system. So since it's an all-pole system, what must happen to the Nyquist plot? The magnitude must keep decreasing with frequency. The phase must keep the phase lag also must keep increasing with frequency, right. So, the phaser which starts off here must spiral its way eventually to the origin, right. So, depending on the order of the system, it will eventually approach the origin at some multiple of pi by 2. If it is a third order system, it will approach it at from two, the 270 degree side. If it is a fourth order system, it will approach it back from 0, right. But the bottom line is that the magnitude cannot cannot increase, can only decrease with frequency. And let us say the system was unstable, it was stable to begin with. So, if this was the minus 1 comma 0 point, all right, then you can clearly see that by increasing the gain in the system, what will happen? you will start, if I increase the gain, I will start from here, this whole plot will get scaled like this and I see that, is this unstable now, the blue curve, is it unstable or, it is unstable because when I plot the other half, again, you can see that I am not a great artist. All right. So, to prevent clutter, this definitely encloses the the minus one comma zero point. Okay. How many encirclements do you think we've made? We've made two encirclements. All right. So. Uh, Okay. So, whereas if you had zeros in the Nyquist plot, I mean in the loop gain function, then the Nyquist plot would look like this, okay. And all right. So, when I change the gain, what do you think will happen? If I reduce the gain, what do you think happens? I will only draw half the curve because uh, you seem to be getting confused by the full curve. Okay, so this is one half, let us say. The other half is just a reflection of this. So, if I reduce the gain, do you think the system is becoming, uh, getting closer towards instability or? So, as I reduce the gain, what happens? This fellow, this whole curve shrinks. So, when I reduce the gain, this fellow is coming close to the minus 1 comma 0 point. So, the though your intuition is telling you that low gain, th you think you are okay, you are not, that is not really true. No, I mean I can artificially reduce gain by putting an attenuator, right? Okay. No, no. So, you can, if I reduce the gain, what will happen? I can always find a value of gain where this will come here and this crossing remains on this side of minus 1 comma 0, right. So, I mean what I am trying to counter here is the common belief that reducing gain is good for stability, which is, uh, which is, uh, you know, a common principle that uh, we think uh, should work, okay. But clearly, you know, if I reduce the gain a little bit, 
I can always, I can, for example, end up with a Nyquist half plot like this. Right? Okay, and clearly this is unstable. The closed loop system will be unstable. On the other hand, if I reduce the gain so much, then I can be like this and the system will be stable. Okay? So, this basically means that there are definitely ranges in a high order system with zeros. There will be ranges of gain for which the system will be stable and there will be some ranges where the system is unstable. Correct. Uh, the, uh, I mean, this is probably not very useful because if the gain is very small, I mean, the whole idea behind feedback is you have a forward amplifier, a forward uh, block with such a large gain that the closed loop system's behavior becomes largely independent of the forward amplifier. That's what, you know, uh, you're trying to do, right? You're trying to realize the system. See, uh, we are very good at making transistors. Transistors have a lot of gain. Unfortunately, their gain is varies all over the place. Okay, and we are good at making resistors. Okay, and uh, so resistor ratios are very well controlled. But unfortunately, you can't make an amplifier with a resistor, with resistors only. So this basically using feedback gives you, you use the amplifier, the transistors for what they are good for. They are just good for giving you a lot of gain. Okay, the resistors are good for giving you a very accurate ratio. So, if you put the resistor divider in a feedback amplifier, then if the loop gain, if the power amplifier gain is very, very large, then the closed loop system has properties which are, you get the good things of the resistor divider, which is very accurate gain, right? And you get, I mean, you are getting gain out of the whole system, which you are not able to do only with resistors. Hmm? You are using the transistors to give you gain, but using the resistors and feedback, you are able to control that gain with a lot of accuracy, right? So, uh, so saying, yeah, I will make the system stable by reducing the loop gain is certainly a, a way of stabilizing the system, but that is probably not what you are trying to do in the first place, correct? So, the alternative would be to basically increase the gain. Uh, in this particular example, you could go on increasing the gain and the system would actually become more and more stable because uh, this point is, is getting farther and farther away from the minus 1 comma 0 point. Does it make sense? No, uh, no, no. This is uh, the uh, what I'm setting out to prove here is is just to show that there can be situations where you know your commonly held intuition fails. Yes. Yes. Oh, well, if you are interested in finding out what ranges of uh, G, uh, you know, you need, I mean, you will be stable, then you need to go and plot the Nyquist plot for different values of G and check out if it is stable, right? But there are some few thumb rules, okay, which will almost guarantee that you are there. I will come to them as I finish. So, this covers, I mean, the discussion we just had covers this, right, which is, I have a feedback system on the verge of instability. Now, I increase the loop gain by a factor larger than 1. So, the question is, the, and then I find that the closed loop system becomes nice and stable, right? So, the question is, is this possible? And based on our discussion, it is very much possible, right? Provided there is 0, okay? Now, on the other hand, this also brings the opposite, which is if I had a stable feedback system and if I decrease the loop gain, it can also become unstable, which is also somewhat counterintuitive uh, if we just go by the and uh, everything is possible as we can see from the 
Nyquist plot. So this is the uh, so the system is in the in the blue curve is definitely more stable than the system in the drawn in red. And again, in both cases, the loop gain is starting out somewhere there, coming back, and then going like this. And both cases, they don't encircle the minus one comma zero point, but you can see that the distance from here to here is much larger. And this is a case where I reduce the gain and uh, the system actually becomes unstable. So, this is uh, so uh, to you know kind of sum up uh, all the uh, intuition we have developed using the Nyquist plot and from uh, Nagendra's discussion earlier this morning, uh, one thing is for sure, if you have a first order system, if your loop gain g h is first order, right, so you k 1 by s, then this closed loop system is, is unconditionally stable, but unfortunately the forward amplifiers we use are not first order systems. They have many poles because you use, you cannot get uh, enough gain from a single stage, so you cascade many stages to get a high gain, correct. So, uh, what is the obvious thing? So, you know, if you had a first order system, it is unconditionally stable. Unfortunately, poor DC gain, correct? If you had a third order system, it is unstable, but you have high DC gain, what do you want to do? You want to marry both these guys such that you get the good points of both, right, not the bad points of both, mm, that can also happen. Mm. All right. So, so how? So, what do you think we can do as engineers? So, if you somehow make this third order system look like a first order system, then you will get all the benefits of the first order system as far as stability is concerned. Okay, and you will get the benefits of DC gain as far as the third order system is concerned. You've seen one instance like this already in the morning. So, when uh, uh, Nagendra was, uh, was uh, uh, talking about second order systems, he said that you must move, if you, if you had uh, a by 1 plus s by, divided by 1 plus s by p 1 and a by 1 plus s by p 2, correct? If a is very, very large, clearly cascading two stages gives you a DC gain which is a square, but if p 1 and p 2 are the same, we saw that the, the damping factor of the closed loop system is, is very small, right. And damping factor being very small is very problematic in an amplifier, because you touch the amplifier and keeps doing, starts ringing and eventually settles only after a long, long time. Hmm? So, it is like taking a ride in a Chennai city bus, okay. You hit a pothole and then you duck, 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 duck and goes eventually. That is not what you want to do, is not it? So, what did we, so what was the solution? We said we are going to, the only way to make a respectable behavior as far as the amplifier is concerned in closed loop is to, what did we do in the morning? You push one pole, you know, much farther away from the other. You can push two poles away from each other in many ways. What is, what are the ways can you think of? One is, you have, we have P1 and P2, right? 
you can push P2 much higher than P1 or you can pull P1 much lower than P2. Correct? What do you think is a, is a, is a practical thing the, that you do end up doing most of the time? Pardon? I mean, you know, it is a, P2 being higher is equal, a pole frequency push, pushing it higher is equivalent to saying what? Make it fast or slow? If poles are at high frequency, what does it mean? So, do you think it is easier to make people go fast or make people go slow? It is easier to make things to go slowly. So, the easiest thing is to, you do not know, you do not try to go up, you pull the other fellow down, right? You understand? So, if we pull P1 much lower than P2, what is this basically doing? Earlier, the Bode plot was like this. So, this is A square or 20 log A square and at P1, earlier P1 and P2 were the same. So, this starts falling off at 40 dB per decade. Then what do you do? You pull P1 much lower. So, it starts to do, to fall off at 20 dB per decade all the way up to around here. Sorry. I will move it. This is the 0 dB line. And then it starts, P2 is still where it was. So, it starts to do this. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Oh, well, uh, so the question is how do you pull P1 low without changing the DC gain? Is, do you think it is possible to pull a pole much lower in frequency and not change the DC gain at all? It is actually very easy to do, right? So, you take a look, take some node, you put a big capacitor there. It is not changing the DC gain at all, but it is pulling the pole lower. So, it is definitely possible to pull a pole at to a lower frequency without changing the DC gain. That is precisely what we have done here, right. So, you can see that at very low frequencies, the Bode plot magnitude remains the same and then it starts to roll off at 20 dB per decade and then at this point, P2 kicks in and then starts rolling off at 40 dB per decade, okay. So, if I compare this system to, a, to an ideal first order system, with a pole at P1, how would the Bode plot of an ideal uh, first order system, a true first order system with, uh, uh, at, with pole at, at P1 look like? It would do this and it would keep continuing all the way up to infinity, correct? Uh, so, this is the 0 dB line. So, what has the action of pulling P1 lower, what has it done? Hey, look at this. The green line is an ideal first order system. The red line, okay, is the is the fake first order system, which is actually a second order system, but is made to look like a first order system. But clearly, you can't fool everybody all the time, correct? So you can see that at some frequency or the other, you will start to see a difference between the first order system and the the, the true first order system and the fake first order system, okay? But that in this particular example is occurring at such a large frequency that, I mean, when do you think all these guys are going to cause trouble, these extra poles? The loop gain, I mean, see, the, the closed loop gain is basically 1 by h divided by g h divided by 1 plus g h, right? So, this feedback action is happening only at frequencies where GH is much larger than 1 and, and around 1 is where you start to see funny things happening to the closed loop, is not it? So, if, you, if, if uh, 
if the fake first order system does not resemble the true first order system at frequencies which are very very high okay you don't really care because the feedback action is dead at those frequencies anyway because the forward amplifier gain has fallen down so much does this make sense okay you understand so it makes sense to mimic the first order system all right in the frequency range where the loop gain is much larger than 1 and is falling off all the way you know up to unity and and perhaps a little while after also does it make sense so please note that all the you know the the notion of poles going into the right half plane all that is happening when this the, the critical point is when this gh is a prop is close to 1 because if this becomes minus 1 by any chance you're finished correct all right so uh, um, all right so let me now ask you another question this also has got to do with true first order systems versus fake first order systems this is the body plot of a true first order system keeps going down and down and down this on the other hand is the body plot of uh, a fake first order system this is a true first order system and this guy is a fake guy okay all right so do you think this is a problem okay see please note that uh, one thing is that on the body plot what is the axis x axis is plotted in log or linear log, log. So, where is 0 in the body, axis, body uh, plot? Where is the 0 frequency? Where? Here? It is there. Correct? So, if I only show you this part of the body plot and it looks like 20 dB per decade, you do not really know what is happening at, at real DC. Okay? And you would say this is a pretty good approximation to. I mean, you, if the body plot was <coughs> was like this, and I only showed you this part of the plot, I didn't show you stuff at DC. Nobody can show you stuff at DC because it's, it's sitting in the next building, isn't it? So if some if this guy does some funny business there, do you think it should matter? Yes. Okay, so let us try and understand that using the Nyquist plot. In the Nyquist plot, what does DC correspond to? It will be somewhere on the real axis, correct? So, what matters as far as the Nyquist plot is concerned is the behavior here, correct? A true first order system will be a semicircle like this right so what you are trying to do is to approximate this i mean and where is this coming closest to the danger point it is around this this area here right so what happens there or i mean in reality if the gain is very high basically that point at which the nyquist plot starts will be somewhere there whether there it is going at 20 db per decade or 40 db per decade it is hardly immaterial because this po that point is so far away from the minus 1 comma 0 point that the encirclement all that stuff only you have to be worried about this part of the curve. Okay. Another way of thinking about it is I mean all along if I you know I told you that this is a first order system Okay, here by this part it is a first order system 
and see for yourself. Go and make measurements and plot a body plot, right? And you will plot, I mean, you will say, okay, I will start from 10 hertz and then this is 100 hertz and then this is like, you know, uh, you know, 100 megahertz, okay? And sure enough, your, your, the, the system keeps doing, starts at, uh, keeps falling off at 20 dB per decade. But who knows, if you had measured it at 0 0.0001 hertz, maybe it started going up at 40 dB per decade. You won't even know, right? So as far as you are concerned, the, the frequencies, you know, in and around the unity gain point, all right, are what make sense as far as stability is concerned. So the Bode plot, so whatever you do to this high order system to make it look like a first order system, you must make sure that in and around the unity gain crossover, it behaves like a first order system, which means that it must have a roll off of, a true first order system will have a roll off of 20 dB per decade. So around the unity gain crossover, if the magnitude, the loop gain function has a 20 dB per decade roll off, then you are doing okay, all right. So that is the, uh, so again as I said, so that is the intuition behind this, uh, this bullet which is the magnitude plot must have a slope of 20 dB per decade around the unity gain frequency. There can be any number of poles to the left or the right, okay, as long as they occur sufficiently far away from the unity gain crossover, okay. All right, and uh, so uh, if if uh, you can also show that if the magnitude plot is sloping at 20 dB per decade um, around the unity gain frequency, the phase, okay, will be uh, will be approximately 90 degrees. It will be a little larger than 90 degrees. Okay, so even in high order systems with transmission zeros, phase margin is a valuable metric to assess relative stability, okay. So if you have third, two third order systems uh, with uh, the same DC gain and so on, if one has uh, a smaller phase margin than the other, then you can conclude that the one with the smaller ma phase margin is, 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 uh, uh, is more, uh, you know, prone to oscillation. And uh, the bottom line therefore is to stabilize the high order system you must make it look like a unity gain, I mean like a first order system around the, the unity gain crossover. So I mean and the, the wider the range you make it look like a first order system around the unity gain crossover, the, the more it resembles a true first order system, right and therefore you can expect the system to be more stable. Does that make sense? <coughs> okay, so uh, Naginda will take over. Yes, sure. So pulling P1 down in the second order example will definitely uh, affect bandwidth, but that's the price you pay for to having. It's better to have a slow, stable guy than some guy who's unstable, isn't it? So that's the price you pay for. Yes. Yes. No, I mean the basic ideas are uh, are still the same, right? So. Uh, no, but in, in a uh, so see, you will always want to have high gain at DC because you if you're trying to build an amplifier with with which is uh, DC which processes DC, you want to make sure that it has a high gain at DC, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, 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 of course, you can always con anybody by, you know, having, showing them only selective plots of, selective parts of the body plot, okay? But the general belief is that if one guy, if it keeps going down, it probably, you know, 
doesn't come up all the way much beyond the unity gang crossing. Hmm? You understand? But you can always con people, right? Just like how companies con uh, with fake balance sheets. You know, you can uh, you can show only parts of those uh, things which are which are nice and clean. Hmm? Okay. <coughs> 